Ну вот сегодня у нас совместное заседание семинара э, Михаила Карпанова и э, нашей лаборатории. Э, и у нас докладчик из университета Шарлотты, Каролина Шарлотты, там два университета, на самом деле, да, Чеково Фильм, Северная Каролина, Вера Шарлотты, вот, э, который вот прочтет серию докладов из, из пяти лет. Да? Вот. И сегодня более, так я понимаю, экономически будут звучать нотки, а потом больше вероятности да, на следующей лекции. Вот. Ну вот, я представил, пожалуйста. And although he's not here, I'd like to thank Professor Molchanov for helping to set up this uh, series of lectures. Uh, so today's lecture is on uh, uh, do financial returns have finite or infinite variants of paradox and explanation. That will be the, uh, what my first uh, talk will be about. Uh, toward the end, I'd like to say maybe a few words about some of the other lectures so that uh, you will have some idea of what else I'll talk about and um, hopefully see what you find interesting. Um, but uh, for this talk, of course, um, this question of whether financial returns have a finite or infinite variance has a very long history. And um, I did at, at first, when people first started just talking about modeling financial returns, uh, the first distribution they used was the normal distribution, which has a finite variance and the very, uh, very light tails. Uh, by the, uh, and this would have been used up to the 50s. But then in the 1960s, in a influential paper by Mendelbrot, he suggested maybe that there's actually much more variation than what could be captured by the normal distribution, and suggested using okay. infinite variance uh, stable distributions instead. Um, so first, what is it that we're trying to model? Uh, financial returns are defined to be the difference in the log prices of some financial asset. So if PT is the price of some financial asset, if we uh, assume that we have observed this asset at uh, evenly spaced time points, then the log return is just defined uh, this way. So this is the main thing that we try to model in mathematical finance. And as I mentioned, historically, the two most famous distributions for modeling returns have been the Gaussian distributions, or in other words, the normal distribution and infinite variance stable distributions. Um, of course, there's much more, uh, much more general class of models, and one important class, very general class of models, is that with regularly varying tails, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. But first, I just want to uh, remind everyone what is a stable distribution. And a stable distribution is one that's essentially stable under addition. What I mean by that is, so if you have a sequence of IID random variables, x1, x2, x3, and so forth, it's, then its distribution is called stable if, when we add up x1 up to xn, up to some shift and scaling term, it's equal in distribution to x1. And this could be uh, in one dimension for random variables or in general in d dimensions uh, for random vectors. Um, so basically, if you add the distributions, uh, the random variables together, the distribution only changes up to a shifting and a scaling. And it turns out we can prove that this uh, scaling term an is necessarily of the form n to the minus 1 over alpha, where alpha is some value between 0 and 2. It can't equal 2, but it can equal, uh, what's this? Well, no, 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 no. Okay, so yes, yeah, so alpha cannot equal zero, but it can equal two, and if it equals two, then that corresponds to the normal distributions, and in any other case, it will be an infinite variance distribution. Um, now, if we can take the, uh, this shifting term bn to be identically zero, then we say that such a distribution is strictly stable. Now, the reason stable distributions are important and they come up and, and that they come up in applications is basically for the same reason that the normal distribution is important and comes up in applications. Specifically, 
because they satisfy a central limit theorem type result. So if we take x1 up to x, so if, uh, if x is any um, random vector, and if we can take x1 up to xn ID copies of this uh, random vector, if the sum of x1 up to xn, up to some shifting and scaling, converges in distribution to some random vector y, we say that it is in the domain of attraction of this random vector y. And um, the generalized central limit theorem tells us that the only distributions with a non-empty domain of attraction are infinite variant or are stable distributions. Uh, of course, they can either be the normal distribution or infinite variance uh, uh, stable distributions. So for that reason, stable distributions can come up in applications because they're really this uh, anytime we have something that's the sum of many smaller IIT components, it has to be well approximated by some stable distribution. Now, if we get back to financial returns and we look at, uh, at what they are, really financial returns, um, since, they're this, uh, since they're defined this way, we can really think of them as a sum of, ter of uh, returns at a different aggregation level. So for instance, let's say we have one hour returns, and if you want to get two hour returns, then it's really going to be the sum of the two one hour returns in this um, in this period, if we wanted to get, um, uh, say, the number, of, uh, say, the uh, daily return for the whole day, we would add up all of the log returns for the hours in that day, um, and so forth. So we can see that returns at any frequency are really sums of returns at um, higher frequencies. So this suggests that returns. Uh, sh should be well approximated by some kind of stable distributions, at least for large enough aggregation levels. Of course, I'm leaving aside the fact that no returns aren't really IID, but nevertheless, this gives us some at least heuristic idea that stable distributions would be reasonable models for, uh, for returns at, um, at lo relatively large aggregation levels. Um, now, of course, the returns at smaller aggregation levels still have some distribution, and there's no, um, there might be no reason to think that they're stable, but a very common model is to assume that they have regularly varying tails. So, what do I mean by distributions with regularly varying tails? Well, we say that a distribution has a regularly varying right tail if the probability that x is greater than uh, little x basically behaves asymptotically at x to the minus alpha. Specifically, it's equal to x minus alpha times L of x, where L of x is a slowly varying function. Now, um, slowly varying function basically means that it's uh, either is asymptotically a constant, or whatever it does asymptotically is, not, is going to be, uh, is not going to have a strong effect compared to any power. Now the formal definition, let me maybe write it here, is L is slowly varying if L of Tx divided by L of T uh, in the limit as T goes to infinity converges to 1. So the fact that we have an x here does not uh, play any role. And so Functions like logarithm or 1 divided by a logarithm are good ways to think about um, slowly varying functions. Now, this is the, what I said is for a right tail. Of course, we can look at the left tail of x, and it, we would like it to also be regularly varying, although possibly with a different uh, value of um, alpha. And so we can get a similar definition for regular variation of the left tail, and we'll refer to the smaller of the two tail indices, right? One is one determines the tail of the, the right tail, the other one determines the left tail, and the smaller of the two we will call just the tail index. So a way of asking the, um, the question about do financial returns have finite or infinite variance is to ask if we do accept this model that returns are regularly varying, 
what, what is, in what range does alpha belong? If alpha is between 0 and 1, that means that the distributions have not just an infinite uh, variance, but an infinite uh, mean. Which, um, for financial returns, I, don't, I think nobody really thinks that they have an infinite mean. But if alpha were between 0 and 1, that would be the ramification. If alpha is between 1 and 2, then its mean is finite, but the variance is infinite. And with alpha being greater than 2, that means that the variance is finite. So another way of asking a return, so do they have a finite or infinite variance, is whether alpha is smaller than 2 or larger than 2. Now, a, a, random, a variable x is said to have balanced regularly varied classic, not only if, if its absolute value is regularly varied, and if this um, tail ratio converges to some constant between 0 and 1. Now, if 1 and 2 hold with alpha uh, between 0 and 2, that is equivalent to the random variable x belonging to the domain of attraction of an alpha-stable random variable. Uh, and it would suggest that when we aggregate them together, an infinite variance alpha-stable distribution would be um, a good model. On the other hand, if alpha is greater than or equal to, in which case we don't even need uh, the tail balancing condition to hold. Uh, we only need number one to hold, but if alpha is greater than or equal to, then by the, that means that the variance is finite, and by the usual central limit theorem for finite variance, that would mean that, this distribu uh, that the distribution of x is well approximated by a normal distribution. Okay, so what this tells us is that if x1, uh, x2, up to xn, are iid random variables, then for large enough n, this sum is approximately Gaussian if alpha is larger than 2, and approximately stable, infinite variance stable, if alpha is between 0 and 2. So is alpha larger than 2? Well, there's been, there's, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of debate, a lot of publications trying to answer this question in various ways. Um, I'm just given just a very, a very few uh, examples here, but Rachev and Mitnik, uh, 2000, finds infinite variance in alpha <coughs> less than 2, while Blackberg and the Gonids and Lau Lau Windegar report a finite variance, and so alpha would be greater than 2. Uh, and this is, as I said, just a very small collection. There's been lots of papers written on this topic, um, and different people have different opinions about uh, what it means. Now, what's really interesting and paradoxical is that actually, if we try to estimate the tail index, and there's a variety of ways to do it, but when people have tried to estimate the tail index, what seems to happen is that at least the empirically estimated tail index is increasing, which is something that cannot happen with uh, stable distributions, but really cannot happen at all for regular varying distributions. And even Dependence does not seem to answer why this would happen because it's been studied under a variety of realistic dependence structures and even with them, the tail index cannot actually increase. Um, so, so this fact that the tail index is increasing uh, at least seems to suggest that maybe regularly varying distributions are not quite the right model to use. Um, so it's been pointed out that this is not uh, consistent with regular variation. So the way, uh, at least we propose to resolve this um, paradox in this um, paper, which uh, I should have mentioned is joined with uh, Gennady Zomorodnitsky. Um, so we resolve this by saying that returns are not actually regularly varying. They might, be, they might appear to be regularly varying, but they're not actually regularly varying. Instead, they have a a distribution of a form we call tempered heavy tails. So when we say tempered heavy tails, we don't, uh, we're not going to give actually a uh, very formal mathematical um, definition because there's many ways to, to, uh, to temper heavy tails. What we'll just say is intuitively a distribution with tempered heavy tails is one which we start with a heavy tail distribution that has an infinite um, variance. Uh, I'm sorry, not an infinite variance, but that ju just has um, regularly varying tails. 
with some parameter alpha, and then we modify those tails somehow, and I'll, I'll leave it open as to how we will actually do it, um, in such that you make the tails actually become lighter eventually. So there's many ways to do it. One, of course, simple approach is, well, we start with a distribution. In this case, our, our heavy tail distribution is stable. And we could just truncate the tails. So we just say, OK, if it's um, larger than 10 or uh, smaller than negative 10, we just will not, um, we'll, we'll just assume that it's bounded between negative 10 and positive 10. And of course, we need to multiply by a normalizing constant to make sure that this distribution is still a valid probability distribution. But in this case, normalizing constant is very, very close to 1. So actually, we would have a lot of trouble unless we had a lot of data to be able to detect the difference between this truncated distribution and this uh, not truncated one. So, uh, so this is one way, but there's various more delicate ways that one can modify the tails. So we don't want to just limit our, ourselves to a very technical uh, the definition that would not capture various other approaches. Can I ask? Yes. How did you compute this constant? Is it repeated? Um, <laughs> you write it to one. Ah, <laughs> right, this is at least. Yes. Uh, okay. just, I mean, I, I, I think I used some numerical degradation. Uh, okay. Have to do that. Okay. So. There's been many examples of this, this kind of uh, tempered heavy tail distribution. Uh, so some of the better known ones are truncated Levy flights, which uh, as far as I know were first uh, appeared in a paper by Montana and Stanley in 1994, which was exactly this idea. You start with a stable distribution and then you just truncate its tails. Um, which, which is uh, nice and gets to this idea very directly but maybe isn't completely realistic. If you think of it in terms of modeling returns, what we're saying in this kind of a picture is that basically there's no risk beyond negative 10, right? That the risk is completely bounded. And that's maybe not what we really want to, um, to say. So while this is useful as just getting to this idea, um, it, it may um, underestimate risk and, and is not maybe uh, that practical. So um, about a year later, uh, in a paper by Kaponen, basically suggested a somewhat different way of doing it, of changing the tails of a stable distribution uh, to make the tails uh, decay exponentially fast. This was done at the level of uh, Levy measures. And uh, Kaponen was basically building on the work of Mantana and Stanley, but it turns out that the distributions that he was using, at least uh, many of these distributions had previously been studied by Tweedy in 1984, although from a very different perspective, not coming from the idea of modifying the tails of stable distributions. Then in 2007, uh, Rosinski published a um, very general class of these kind of distributions that modify the tails of stable models at the level of Levy measures to make them lighter. Um, and later, in, uh, Rosinski and Sinclair had a, a published a different paper which goes about a somewhat different way of modifying the tails of stable distributions called generalized tempered stable distributions. Um, but one thing that we can notice that all uh, four of these papers have in common, or four, all four of these models have in common, is that they start with a stable distribution modify its tails. Now, why do we want to modify the tails of stable distributions? On, on the one hand, um, it could, it's uh, partly because stable distributions are one of the most commonly used heavy tail models. So it makes sense that if you were to start modifying the tail somewhere, uh, starting with uh, uh, stable distributions is, seems reasonable. But on the other hand, uh, these models also really seem to do a really good job fitting the data really quite well. So while one can work with a variety of uh, tempered heavy tail models, ones that temper stable distribution specifically uh, do a very good job. And uh, the question we could ask is, well, why would this happen? Right? The central, lim the central limit theorem tells us that stable distributions should come up in applications when we have heavy tails. But if we don't have heavy tails, there's no reason to expect something stable-like, uh, at least up uh, to begin with. There's no reason to expect something stable-like, but with lighter tails. So uh, what is the mechanism 
uh, by which these kind of distributions arise. And I'd like to try to motivate how this could come up in applications by giving a very, very specific example. So consider the symmetric Pareto distribution, uh, which is a simple distribution whose uh, uh, Lebesgue density is given here, where C is some normalizing constant, B is some uh, number greater than zero, uh, which is there just to make sure that this will converge, right? Because if uh, near zero, this function is uh, going to blow up to infinity, so we need to be bounded away from zero by some constant B. Uh, but otherwise, it basically gets to, in the most direct way, to the idea of regularly varying tails by basically, not even the tails, just the whole distribution is exactly uh, x to the um, minus 1 minus alpha, and if we integrate it to look at the tail, it would be exactly x to the minus alpha, um, times some constant. Now, if alpha is between 0 and 2, then this distribution uh, is the domain of attraction of an infinite variance stable distribution. Of course, if alpha is greater than um, 2, it'll, be, it'll have a finite variance and be in the domain of attraction of the normal. But let's consider the case when alpha is between 0 and 2. And now, let's um, consider a, mod of, uh, a slightly different model, where we now truncate the tail of this symmetric Pareto distribution and say, well, not only must we be bounded away from zero, but let's make sure we're also bounded away from t. So we're, essentially we're just cutting the tails off as we did for the stable distribution in the picture that we saw a little bit earlier. Okay, so now we have this, uh, and of course we have a slightly different normalizing constant, although if t is very large, the normalizing constant will not be too different from the original model. Now, one way we can simulate from this truncated model is we can use an accept-reject algorithm. So we can first simulate a random variable x from the original symmetric Pareto, from this one, where we don't do any truncation. And then if uh, our value x is less or equal to t, we accept the value. Otherwise, we reject the value and, um, and sample again. Alpha and b is supposed to be known. Uh, yes, alpha and b are known. Um, and T is known as well, yeah. for just for this discussion. Yeah. So, just to, just to give an example of this kind of uh, situation. So, okay, so now we can uh, simulate from this uh, truncated one using this accept-reject method. And let's consider we do a whole sequence this way. So we start with a sequence Xi of, uh, of um, symmetric Pareto's, not truncated. And then we kind of thin out this sequence. We throw out large values uh, and only keep values less or equal to t. And this new sequence that we obtain is going to be this sequence of yi's. Now let's consider if we do the so we consider the first n observations in this uh, sequence. And let's assume n is maybe quite large, but t is even larger. So we're considering the situation where um, we have maybe a large sample, but still n is very small relative to t. Well, if that's the case, then it's really unlikely that in the first n values we actually would have done any rejecting. Right? It's possible, but it's not likely that we would have rejected any of the first n values. So that suggests that the sum of the first n xi's should be uh, with high probability equal to the sum of the first n yi's. So if, if, the, if, uh, if there's a high probability that these two sums should be equal to each other, then there's a high probability, uh, then the two distributions should somehow be similar to each other. Although, of course, the, y, the distribution of the sum of the yi's necessarily has to be like tail, while the distribution of the sum of the xi's is heavy tailed, but in the center, central part of the distribution, uh, the distribution should be very similar because, as we just said, these two sums with very high probability are actually equal to each other. Now, assume that n, while still very small relative to t, but is large enough that we already start feeling the effects of the central limit theorem on the sum of the xi's. 
That means that the sum of the x i is. What sh times? I'm sorry? Sum of y times, not x. Central limit. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, when, I, when I just said central limit theorem, I meant the generalized central limit theorem for uh, for a convergence to be infinite variance stable. So yeah, thank you for the clear, uh, for the correction. Um, so yes, uh, let's assume that n is large enough that the sum of the um, x i, the heavy tail of random variables, is already well approximated by the infinite variance stable distribution. Well, since we're saying the distribution of the sum of the yi's is very similar to that of, of this sum of the xi's, it should also be similar to this uh, infinite variance stable distribution, yet necessarily it has lighter tails. Um, so, so this would suggest that a distribution that looks like a stable in some central region, but with lighter tails, would be a very reasonable model for the sum of the y i's. So let's, um, let's look at some simulations to see if this heuristic really does seem to work out. So we'll fix, just for concreteness, fix alpha equal to 1.5, take b equals 0.5, and truncate at uh, not, a, not too large a value, at t equals 70. So here is the truncated symmetric Pareto, that's this, um, kind of two, um, what's this, this thing in the middle in the black? It uh, has two modes. And then uh, the red, um, I'm sorry, that's the truncated smash operator. The, the red distribution, that's the normal distribution in whose domain, to whose domain of attraction we know actually this distribution belongs. And in blue is the stable distribution, um, which if we hadn't done the truncation, would be what um, this would converge to. Uh, so it would, if we hadn't done the truncation, we'd be in the domain of attraction of the blue infinite variance stable distribution. But since we did the truncation, it's actually the domain of attraction of the red normal distribution. So let's see what happens when we actually do um, uh, when we actually do the uh, aggregation. So here we have, um, in the first um, case, we just have the infinite variance distribution and the um, uh, truncated uh, symmetric Pareto. Um, it looks a little bit different because in this case, before I just gave you the actual distribution, here this is basically we're estimating the density from, uh, from the data um, because for the later situations, it's very difficult to get the true distribution uh, numerically. So um, now in the second one, we have, we've aggregated 50 of these truncated symmetric Pareto's, and we see at this point, the normal, the, uh, sorry, the infinite variance stable distribution is doing a very, very good job modeling uh, the distribution. Uh, when, when the sample size gets to 150, so we're looking at an, a sum of 150 IID uh, the, the truncated symmetric Pareto uh, random variables, in this case, uh, the, uh, the density of the stable distribution still does not maybe okay job somewhere, but we start seeing some deviations both in the peak of the distribution and in the tails. The tails, we, we are clearly seeing the tails of the, uh, symmetric, the truncated symmetric Pareto of being, after aggregation becoming looking quite a bit lighter than those of the normal, of the stable distribution. And by the time we get a sample size of 300, the, um, the stable model is no longer very good. Now, uh, now let's consider how well the normal distribution does in approximating the truncated symmetric Pareto uh, after aggregation. So of course, as we saw before, the truncated symmetric Pareto looks nothing like the normal distribution. And after we aggregate 100 um, IID truncated symmetric Pareto, still, uh, the distribution does not look very much like the normal. It looks more so, but it's still quite far away. Once we get to a sample size of n equals 500, now we're getting quite a bit closer to the normal, although we still see some deviations in the tails in the uh, very tip of the distribution. And well, n equals 1,000, now the, uh, the distribution seems to be well approximated by the normal. So. First, one, one thing that this, this does kind of uh, show, kind of as an aside, is so in, uh, in a lot of uh, 
introductory statistics courses, a lot of the textbooks say when you have a finite variance, if you add about 50 IID random variables together, they're well approximated by a normal. And here we see a definite counterexample to that kind of um, uh, rule of thumb. Um, and then uh, to get back to what, well, why we're looking at this, we definitely see a situation where for, um, um, for a variety of aggregation levels, we have a distribution that actually has leg tails, belongs to the domain of attraction of the normal, and yet for a wide variety of values, it seems to be approaching an infinite variance stable distribution after aggregation up to a point. But for very large values of n, it's actually approaching the normal as it must by the central limit theorem. Okay. Uh, Maybe let me give uh, one more example of this kind of behavior in the, through simulation. This is a smoothly truncated Levy flight, which I mentioned um, a little bit earlier as one of the common models of modifying the tails of stable distributions, um, originating in the paper of uh, components and go back to Tweedy's paper. And, um, and this is its characteristic function. And in particular, um, this has light tails and exponentially decaying tails, and this uh, distribution belongs to the domain of attraction of the normal. But when alpha, uh, uh, when the parameter L here goes to infinity, it actually converges to an infinite variance uh, stable distribution with this characteristic function. So we can think of it as this parameter L kind of modifying the distribution to make it. Um, uh, the, the distribution of this stable distribution to make the tails lighter. Um, and I'll talk more about this class of distributions in my second lecture, but here I think it's a nice example of this kind of uh, behavior. So, now for a uh, simulation study, let's fix uh, some values of alpha equals 0.95. The scaling term is uh, is given here, and let's take L to be something large, but not too large. We know that when L approaches infinity, this will be uh, close. Uh, this will approach uh, the stable distribution. But let's take L to be 100. Now, if we look at it, um, of course, we know that to begin with, it's well. Uh, so here's how it's uh, um, how well it's approximated by the stable distribution, and we know since L is large, it to begin with already should be a, a well approximated by the stable. And we see that that's the case. Um, and uh, at n equals 50, it's still, we might we see maybe a little bit of deviation in the tip, but basically uh, it still looks very much like a stable. But we also know that it has finite uh, variance and it's eventually approaching a normal. And we see that uh, by the time n equals 200, it's already a lot less um, uh, well, appro well approximated by the stable. And by when we get to n equal to 500, the stable distribution, uh, the stable model is not doing a good job with this at all. On the other hand, if you look at the normal distribution, well, when n equals one, normal looks uh, the normal distribution in, to which the domain, to which the domain of attraction is actually belonging to. Well, when n equals one, normal does a terrible job. Even n equal to 5,000. Uh, so we've aggregated a lot of random variables, and still, it's not well estimated by uh, the, uh, the normal distribution. There's n equal to, uh, to 10,000, uh, still not a very good fit. There's n equal to 20,000, and it's, uh, well, it's getting, it's getting there slowly, but, uh, but it's getting there. As we know from the theory cast. So we see now this kind of behavior where the distribution is um, kind of might, might be might look like a, a stable distribution, or even might start not as a stable distribution, start to appear like it's approaching a stable distribution before ultimately uh, doing something else. And so we could kind of call this a fake central <laughs> behavior because if we were just to observe this, we'd say, oh, okay, this must be in the domain of attraction of a stable because it's very, it looks a lot like a stable, it's getting maybe closer and closer to a stable, but actually that's kind of fake because in reality, it might still be approaching a normal if we did an even larger uh, aggregation. So how can we mathematically explain this kind of behavior? So um, we basically, 
an explanation of this fake central limit theorem type behavior on the pre-limit theorems of Ivanov, Radchev, and Zakeli from their uh, paper in 1999. Um, so we, uh, so the, for our approach, so they did this in uh, one dimension, we generalized it to more, multiple dimensions and um, at least I, I had some trouble understanding their proof, so we have a slightly different uh, approach for some parts of how this is done, and our end result is a little bit different from the one that they had, but the basic idea of this kind of looking at what happens in the pre-limit before uh, when n is large but not too large goes back to this paper of Kiban and Rachid and Sakeli. So the approach is uh, we'll introduce a metric on the space of probability measures, and then we'll uh, try to bound the distance between a um, partial, uh, scaled partial sum and um, some uh, strictly stable distribution and see how well it does it in approximating uh, the uh, distribution of the sum. So first we need to introduce a, uh, this metric that we'll be working with, which is this metric uh, k sub h, which is basically just the soup distance between the CDF of x and the CDF of y, except we do some smoothing. So we uh, look at the den uh, some probability density h. So I, usually I think of h as being some uh, normal, uh, the density of some normal distribution with a very small standard deviation. And we do this kind of uh, smoothing, we convolute f uh, sub x and f, uh, f sub y with this uh, density. So actually, although f and y are CDFs, what we're actually looking at is the distance between two densities that have been uh, smoothed. And uh, we'll assume that H satisfies um, a Lipschitz condition and that its characteristic function does not vanish. <coughs> when this is the case, this metric will metrize weak convergence, which if uh, we didn't do the smoothing, if we just took, looked at the soup distance between Fx and Fy, that would not metrize weak convergence. Now, we'll also need another distance um, between two probability distributions. Uh, this one is not a um, uh, this one is not a metric, but uh, nevertheless it will be useful for our purposes. Now um, this is a distance between x uh, and y and now mu hat x is the characteristic function of x and mu hat y is the characteristic function of y. So basically we're looking at the, now the soup distance between characteristic functions instead of uh, CDFs or, uh, or smooth CDFs or densities. Um, and we divide by z to the gamma, where gamma is some uh, value greater than or equal to zero. And then we consider what happens when we're bound, when, this is, uh, when z uh, is bounded away from zero by some constant c. Now, what's, uh, so what's the intuition behind uh, this uh, distance? Um, right, well, why are we dividing by z to the gamma? Well, if you think about it, if we didn't divide by z to the gamma, this is just some distance and it's uh, going to be pretty small, right? Uh, we, we, for any two distributions, we know that this distance is bounded by two. But when we divide by z to the gamma, that means that when z is very small, uh, this thing could potentially blow up, right? Uh, if, if we didn't bound it away, right? Forgot about the C and just took the supremum over everything, then unless the characteristic function of X and Y were really, really similar in their behavior near zero, this thing would, uh, would just be infinite. So what this lets us look at is what is the behavior of the characteristic functions uh, near zero? Now we know that the, character, the behavior of characteristic functions near zero tells us a lot about the tails of the distribution, right? Um, there's various uh, Tiberian theorems that tell us that if we have regular variation of the tails, we have to have regular variation uh, near zero of the characteristic functions. So there's all kinds of relationships between the tails of the distribution and the behavior of the characteristic function near zero. So if you're trying to get at what happens in the tails, we want to look at um, the characteristic functions near zero. But what we want to get to is not actually the tails, because the tails 
determine that the central limit theorem behavior. What happens um, when we take uh, the sum of IID random variables and the number of terms goes to infinity? But here we're, we're interested in what happens when uh, we take a large but not too large number of terms. So in that case, we could think, well, we don't really want to look at the actual tails of the distribution because those tails will just tell us what happens actually in the full limit. But if you look at just a little bit, kind of the kind of medium tails, not all the way near infinity, but kind of, if you could think of it close to infinity, but not really. Of course, it's hard to think of it close to infinity, but that corresponds to, right, thinking about what do the characteristic functions do close to zero, but not actually at zero. So that's why we want to look at the distance between the characteristic functions, but if we bound away from uh, zero by some constant c, where c might be very small, then we're exactly capturing not do x and y have similar tails, but do they have similar kind of medium tails and not the ultimate tails. Now, um, so it's not, not difficult to see or to show that if we could actually take this with c equal to zero, and it would still be finite, and if x is a strictly stable random uh, vector, then if this distance is finite, that has to imply that x belongs to the domain of attraction of y, again, because that would be capturing exactly what happens in the tails of x and y. But uh, we're bounding ourselves away from zero in order to, um, again, capture kind of the, the behavior of the medium tails. Okay, and so um, this is the a main result that we can get. Um, so again, we're looking at, so now let's take uh, x1, x2, and so forth to be IID, d-dimensional random vectors, and we consider this scaled partial sum. Uh, we assume that y is strictly stable. Um, or uh, we're, uh, for alpha between zero and two, possibly including two. So we're not uh, we're not excluding the possibility of the normal distribution. Now, um, now in that case, if we consider this uh, partial sum, and for any strictly stable distribution, the distance between the distribution of this scale sum and the y is bounded by this uh, maybe kind of messy looking um, object. Uh, but it does say that we can bound this distance by something. And uh, I think, well, I think looking at this in, in this much generality, uh, maybe it looks a little bit, uh, there's too much notation. But let's consider the case when we're actually just in um, one dimension. When we're in one dimension, then that formula reduces to this maybe slightly simpler looking formula. And note, what we're bounding by includes this uh, distance, so uh, d that we introduced earlier, with now our c is this delta n to the minus 1 over alpha. And gamma is just any value larger than alpha. So what, what's happening here? Well, first of all, we have kind of two variables, um, uh, a and delta, which we, we can choose however we like, right? So we just, we, for any values, this, uh, this inequality holds. So when is this inequality going to be small? Well, to make this, the upper bound, small, right? So when the upper bound is small, of course, that will mean that the distribution of Sn is, at least in this metric, close to y. Um, so, um, so if we want to make this side small, what must we do? Well, clearly we have this uh, this term here. Uh, by the way, m sub h that's the Lipschitz coefficient for the R function h, which we use to do the smoothing in the definition of k sub h. So, in order to make this thing uh, small, clearly we have to take a fairly large, right? Because if a is not large. This term will be, uh, will be too large. So if we want to uh, get an upper bound that's kind of small, we need a fairly large a. So with a large a, this term here is going to be uh, small. Now we need to, to balance that out. We need to take a small delta. We have a small delta that will make this term 
here, small. So that takes care of uh, these two terms on the bottom. But what happens on the top? A, we already took to be pretty large. So we see that we have some, fair, some somewhat large term uh, up, up there. But what about this other term here? d sub delta n to the minus 1 over alpha comma gamma of x1, x2 divided by n to the gamma over alpha minus 1. Potentially, uh, uh, under some uh, conditions, that could be quite small. Specifically, assume that um, x1 and, is, uh, and y are such that, this, this, that for some potentially very small c, this distance is very small. When you say small, what it means in terms of n? How do you quantify all your parameters in terms of power of n? Oh, I, I will give some more, uh, um, so, some, some more specific examples where we'll really see that. Here I just want to give some intuition about how we can interpret this admittedly somewhat uh, ugly looking formula. Uh, but uh, I will give some examples where we can actually get our hands on exactly what are good terms to take. This is no asymptotic one. This is for any n. This is true for any n. Mm -hmm. uh, for any n and for any y. This is true, uh, as long as y is strictly stable. Um, of course, there's no reason to believe that always the other, uh, this, uh, this side here is going to be small. It might be very large. So it might, uh, th it doesn't have to be a very formative bound. But what is the case where this bound can actually be small? It can, uh, it can actually be small in this case where if we can take some, uh, small, uh, some c that is small, this, this object here is going to be small as well. When that happens, we can think of it, okay, delta is small, and n to the minus 1 over alpha, right, as that starts getting bigger and bigger, is going to be uh, quite small as well. But even though they're small, if they're still quite large relative to C, um, then, or, um, or I should say, um, yeah, so if they're, if they're still bigger than C, then this distance should be, um, uh, sh should be kind of um, small, and as it gets bigger and bigger, this will be getting closer to C, and so that term there will still stay small. So this term, uh, d sub delta n to the minus 1 over alpha, this distance, can be quite small, even as n starts increasing more and more, so long as delta times n to the minus 1 over alpha is bigger than c. On the other hand, in the denominator, we have this n to the gamma over alpha minus 1, which, since gamma, we're assuming, is bigger than alpha, is, uh, it's, so it's n, uh, as n increases, this is going to make things smaller and smaller and smaller. So what happens when n starts increasing is that n to the gamma over alpha minus 1 is going to start making things smaller and smaller and smaller while the distance still stays small. And so in that case it can be small enough that the whole um, bound is quite small, uh, suggesting that distribution of s, n, and y are pretty similar to each other. Um, it seems that this would take First large A, then small delta, and then large N, everything is okay. Except when N gets too large. Because when N gets too large, we're, the, we're, we're saying that this is going to be small when C is, uh, is some relatively small value of positive. When, uh, however, it may still blow up, right? And we know that, in fact, if it doesn't belong to the domain of attraction of Y, this will, in fact, blow up. So if we can take a small c but still positive, eventually when n gets too large, delta times n to the minus 1 over alpha will become too small. Smaller than c, and all of a sudden this distance that we have will start growing. And potentially, it's going to infinity, potentially uh, quite a bit faster than the n to the gamma over alpha minus 1. So the bound can actually just go uh, to infinity. So, uh, but, but yes, but up to a point, while delta n to the minus 1 over alpha are still smaller than c, then everything is okay and this bound will get smaller and smaller and smaller. So, um, so this is how we can interpret uh, this bound. And I do want to go through the proof of this and how we go about uh, doing this, but I think it would kind of interrupt the flow of the talk if I did that now. So I'd like to 
uh, talk a little bit about and give some examples of this, and then later come back and um, and, and talk about the proof of this uh, of this inequality. Okay. So uh, first, um, I want to mention a little bit. We when we introduced this um, this distance, we introduced this smoothing, right? And I said that well, without the smoothing, we wouldn't metrize weak convergence. On the other hand, with the smoothing, uh, we are modifying the distributions a little bit. So what does that um, modifying really do? So here's a, a slide that kind of shows that. Um, so if, if we are smoothing, let's say by a normal distribution with some small sigma, well, of course, if we don't do any smoothing, we have our, so this is the example of that um, symmetric uh, truncated Pareto distribution. So here it is, how it's supposed to be by itself. But it, now if we convolute it with this uh, stable distribution, uh, with sigma equal to 0 0.01, well, it, it does change the distribution a little bit. The peaks are no, no, uh, not as high anymore. Uh, but the distribution has been changed a lot. Of course, as sigma increases, uh, the, uh, the normal distribution will, will have more and more effect. And here for sigma equal to 0.5, it, maybe we've lost a lot of the characteristic of the original distribution. But if we choose our h in, to be, uh, say, normal with a small sigma, it does not really change um, what happens with the distribution uh, very much. Another way to think of the smoothing is really, um, so one of the most common ways to estimate the density is to use a kernel density estimator. And for a kernel density estimator, we're not really estimating the density of the distribution at all. Right? It's not cons a consistent estimator for the density, it's a consistent estimator of exactly the density convoluted with the kernel. And uh, so you, you could think of um, this bound as really being a bound where we have this, this metric where we have estimated things based on this kernel density estimator. Okay, so now let's go back to the truncated symmetric Pareto and, um, and see how we can use the theorem to um, uh, to, to get a result about um, about this uh, case, so let x be the truncated symmetric Pareto with again alpha between zero and two, the infinite variance case, and it's truncated at some value t bigger than zero, so to be quite large. And of course, we need to be, we have our parameter b, which for simplicity let's just set to one. Now, if uh, x1, x2, and so forth are iid copies of x, we consider our scale partial sum, sum of x1 to xn, scaled by n to the minus 1 over alpha. Now, if we didn't do the truncation, uh, this would be in the domain of attraction of an infinite variance alpha stable distribution. Let's, let's uh, have y be a random variable with this uh, distribution. So, from the theorem, we can uh, get this um, upper bound here. Uh, and, and again, I do want to discuss how we get this, but um, I'll do that a little bit later. So now, if gamma, and in this case we need to make sure gamma is between, not just bigger than alpha, but also less than two alpha, the minimum of two alpha and two. Um, now there is, we can find a constant C, based uh, by kind of manipulating the theorem that we had, we can find some constant c, which is a function of alpha and gamma, but nothing else. Yes. The first term, is it really n in the power 1 or something else? Minus uh, The first term is, is n. Uh, uh, so it's a reason. I'm sorry? You say it is it reason then? Alpha. Um, yes. So, oh. um, yeah, so just uh, uh, give, give me one minute and I'll, and I'll get to how we, we think about that. Um, so, um, so you trade off between n and t, so you have so far, okay. Exactly, it's a trade off between n and t. So we think, uh, so again, from the theorem we can manipulate the terms to get this inequality here. And now we're thinking of t as some large truncation parameter. So we're thinking of t as being very large. Um, uh, so now if, uh, if t is very large, and then let's say we just start, uh, we start, we take n equal to 1. 
right? When n equals 1, what happens is that um, um, uh, when n equals 1, right, the top term is going to be tiny. But the bottom term is going to be quite large, right? Because we have t, some large value, um, well, to the power of alpha that is raised to 1 half times n, but now n is just 1, so, so, that is, so this term here is going to be large. But now let's see what happens when we start increasing n. As n starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger, what's going to happen is that, um, uh, that here, it's going to start getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's going to get smaller and smaller, not just in terms of uh, 1 over n times t to the alpha, but we have this additional uh, term in terms of the n's, making things go to 0 um, even faster. On the other hand, on top, of course, as n gets larger, it starts getting larger and larger and larger, but it's still multiplied by t to the minus alpha, so it's getting larger, but it might still be small for some, uh, uh, for, um, for certain values of, uh, of n. Potentially even n might be getting quite large, but the first term is still fairly small, and the second term, because it's also helped by, by this uh, term here, is also getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So the second term might become quite small, while the first term is still fairly small. And so for those values of uh, n, where both parts are small, that suggests that Sn is well uh, estimated by uh, the distribution of y. Of course, um, as n gets even bigger, well, the, the second term goes to zero, but that doesn't matter much because the first term will go to infinity. Of course, an upper bound going to infinity says nothing about the actual distance, but if we think of it, uh, but so, so the bound in that case isn't telling us any useful information, but of course, from the central limit theorem, we know eventually it converges to a normal and will be very far from the distribution of y. But this tells us exactly that for some values of n, the upper bound may be quite small. So maybe I'm wrong, but the first expression is exercise to, to optimize somehow this expression, find t equals the function of n and find the minimum. So what is the problem here? Well, why could I just optimize it and, and find some absolute bound? Uh, you could probably uh, optimize it um, to find. Uh, because this expression are reciprocal. Uh, sure. Yes, they, they are reciprocal. So what's uh, what's uh, what's helping is this additional n term here, which makes the second term uh, go to zero. Well, at least what uh, uh, faster in a sense than the first term gets large. So what is the result after all? Um, it, it just this gives us a bound to suggest that when um, uh, when n is uh, large but not too large, the bound will be small. But when n is small, the bound is large, and when n, of course, goes to infinity, the bound will get large as well. There are certain values where the bound will be uh, small, which suggests that for those values, the distribution of Sn is close to that one. Now, there, there's ways uh, to talk about exactly for which values of n that will happen. Um, I, I think in the paper we give some, uh, some additional bounds that I didn't include here, uh, but uh, that's kind of the idea. But C doesn't depend on T. C does not depend on N or T, it only depends on gamma and alpha. Should I move on or you have uh... no, okay. yeah. oh. And let's look at the second example of the smoothly truncated Lebesgue flight um, with L being the uh, parameter that when it goes to infinity we approach a stable distribution, but for uh, finite L it's just um, um, it, it has a finite appearance. Um, and now let's look at the sum of uh, IID random variables for this smoothly truncated Lebesgue uh, applied distribution. And we add x1 up to xn, scale it by n to the minus 1 over alpha, it's the same way that we've been talking about for this theorem. And let y be the stable distribution that, if, if we allowed L to go to infinity, that exact stable distribution, let that be y. 
In this case, from, um, from the theorem, we can get um, this upper bound in this way, where c is a constant, not depending on l or n. Um, it depends on some of the other parameters of the distribution, but not uh, on these two. And then the distance uh, between s, n, and y is upper bounded by c times uh, n times l to the minus alpha raised to the power 1 over 2 times uh, gamma plus 1. Well, the more general level, what are the best results known in the literature about the rate of convergence to, to stay below, like Barres and what could be said? Well, how it how goes compared to the general results from the uh, literature? I, I'm not sure uh, about the, the, exactly various okay. things that involve. What could you say at the general level stable. about the rate of convergence to, to add the stable law? Okay, it will be a postponed. Um, yes, I, I mean, this would certainly not. I, I mean, the, so if, uh, when you have a distribution that is in the domain of attraction of a particular distribution, this of course gives you some rate of convergence. It would, uh, I don't think it's. Uh, anywhere near the best in that case, but the nice thing is that this uh, holds even if it's not in the domain of attraction of the stable, and so it allows you to talk about how close it is for certain values of n, even, that, even though for larger values of n, they might be very far from the stable. But, uh, but uh, if it is in the domain of attraction of the stable, definitely um, it gives you a rate of convergence, and we'll go, uh, I, 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 should, I should qualify that. It, uh, this, this actually, actually, this will not, I don't think this will actually be a rate of convergence if it's in the domain of attraction of the stable. It has to be stronger, it has to be in the, the domain of normal attraction of the stable. Uh, which means that, if, if we remember um, initially, right, for domain of attraction, we just have some scaling term. But here, our scaling term is n to the minus 1 over alpha. So we, uh, so if we have a, so. In, in general, the like scaling term is n to the minus 1 over alpha times some slowly varying function. If we have that, then actually we will not get a rate of convergence uh, from, from the, uh, even, even if we go on to the domain of attraction. But in, the, in this case, when it's in the domain of normal attraction, with this kind of a, uh, a, um, a scaling, then this does give us some, uh, but y yes, I, um, I have to look up, I'm not sure what the best known uh, bound is, but I'm, I, I'm, I would be quite confident that it's quite a bit better than this. But again, this is, the nice thing here is, in, in our case, SN is not in the domain of attraction of Y, but we see that the bound, is, we get this bound, and if L is very large, then certainly we can see that this is going to be a very small uh, bound for small N. And then as N gets bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, well, it will still remain small for, right, if L is very large, this will remain small even for quite large values of N. But when N gets um, very big, then of course the bound will uh, blow up and not be very informative. And of course from the regular central limit theorem, we'll know that um, the distribution of SN is well approximated by um, just normal distribution. Yes, but could you remind the flight It's just what the flight with the distribution. Um, uh, so because I, the sense of this L is small. Uh, yes. Um, so I, I will actually I will say more about uh, the interpretation of this uh, in my next lecture, mm -hmm. but um, I did want to include this example. So it, so this is the characteristic function of a. Uh, smoothly truncated of the flight distribution. And L is just a parameter where L, when L goes to infinity, this converges uh, in distribution to a stable distribution with this characteristic function. What about the explicit expression for, for the new measure? Uh, yes, the, so for the Levy measure, um, uh, yeah, so the Levy measure, uh, L of dx for for the truncated relief flight is e to the minus um, x over let me say absolute value of x over L absolute value of x to the minus one minus alpha dx so this is for uh, smoothly truncated relief flight and for uh, the stable we have L of dx equals e I'm sorry no e 
x to the minus 1 minus alpha uh, dx. So if you think of it in terms of the Levy measure, um, can, can you see here? So if you think of it in terms of the Levy measure, uh, we're introducing this exponential decay, which will also correspond to exponential decay of the uh, density. Um, and here, of course, for the stable realm, it, doesn't, it has a polynomial decay. But when L gets big, uh, this thing just approaches 1, and then um, we will we'll get here. And if you think of L as being very large, for some uh, sort of central part of the Levy measure, it will look very similar to this Levy measure here. Uh, right? So if so L is really large, then for medium-sized Xs, it will be indistinguishable. But of course, for very large Xs, uh, we'll really see the exponential decay of the Levy measure. And cor corresponding result holds for the, um, for the density. Okay, so, so in this sense we see that uh, when L gets large, um, so or rather when L is large, the distribution somehow is close to that of the stable, and this kind of captures that. Right? We have this uh, entity L minus alpha, so when L is large, then for small values of n, the bound is very small, and then as n gets bigger and bigger, it will still be small, uh, when n is smaller than l to the minus alpha, but eventually, of course, n will become bigger than that, and the bound will no longer be very useful. And from the regular central limit theorem, uh, we know that, of course, Sn will not be like y at all, but actually be close to a uh, stable, uh, I'm sorry, um, a normal distribution. Okay. So, um, so we call L to the alpha the natural scale of here because it kind of determines when stable-like and Gaussian-like behavior sets in, right? When N is uh, smaller than L to the minus alpha, then, um, or much smaller than L to the minus alpha, then, N is, then the distribution is very close to, uh, to the stable, whereas when, um, when n is, um, uh, sorry, when n is smaller, much smaller than l to the alpha, yes, right, that's the natural scale. When n is much smaller than l to the alpha, uh, the bound will be pretty small, and so it will be close to the stable distribution. On the other hand, when l n is uh, much larger than L to the alpha, well, the bound will not be very useful, but from other theory, we know it will be close to a normal distribution. So, in this sense, L kind of determines when stable-like and normal-like behavior happens. Um, similarly, if we go back for, to our uh, truncated special Pareto, we really need to compare N with T to the power alpha, right? When N is um, smaller, significantly smaller th than T to the alpha, but still fairly large, um, it will be uh, the distribution will be well approximated by the infant variance stable distribution. But when uh, n is much larger than t to the alpha, of course, the bound is uh, not useful. But again, from other results, we know it'll be close to a normal distribution. So, and we conjecture that basically for any uh, distribution with tempered heavy tails, there should be such a natural scale because um, I mean, we're introducing some additional parameters that modify the tails of a um, heavy tail distribution to make them lighter. So those parameters should somehow explain uh, how the transition uh, should happen. Okay, and now to come back to uh, our discussion of financial returns. Um, uh, as we've discussed, financial returns are really sums, and so, uh, if they have regularly varying tails, then the tail index uh, should be the same at aggregation, at all aggregation levels. Um, but the fact that the tail index actually seems to increase suggests that perhaps the distributions are not really regularly varying, uh, but instead they have um, tempered heavy tails. 
And if you think of it uh, in terms of financial markets, there's all kinds of built-in mechanisms that limit the size of fluctuations, right? There's various regulations that try to keep uh, things from jumping too much. Um, so there should be some uh, uh, sort of something that even if in some sense the market wants to um, make a very large jump, there's various things trying to keep it from getting too big. Uh, so that gives kind of an um, interpretation of the, in terms of the application of where this uh, tempering comes from. And the pre-limit theorem that we discussed uh, gives us um, a mathematical explanation of why distributions that have these uh, tempered heavy tails should be well approximated by something with, uh, that looks like a stable distribution but has uh, lighter tails. And so this suggests that models that are kind of heavy tail-like but with, uh, or look stable-like but with tails modified to be lighter would be quite useful models for financial uh, returns. Um, so this is um, kind of basically the, um, what I want to say about the application. And now, as I said, I want to talk a little bit about the proof of some of these results. Um, I think we, we have a break. Um, is this, uh, this might be a good time. But just one small question. Tempering is always means uh, truncation or, or not always? Uh, not necessarily truncation. In the case of the smoothly truncated V flights, although I guess I say truncated, uh, it's smoothly. So right, the, we, we change it in terms of the Levy measure. So actually, the tails are not really cut off. They're just somehow modified to eventually decay. It, 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 so the smooth, uh, the smooth part is talking about that they're modified to do this in a, somehow a smooth way. So I mean, there's various things that you could just truncate some, them. Some and, of the yes. So um, some people just consider let's just truncate them and then glue on other tails. Uh, but this does it kind of in a, in a smoother way than that. But uh, that, that's why I mentioned I don't want to give a very formal um, definition of tempered heavy tails because I want it to be open to what seems reasonable, but just to give this idea of, um, of, of modifying things somehow. Yes? Um, uh, let me ask some uh, small question. Uh, I suppose you know about the sort of ideal matrix approach. No? Um, I've, um, because, you know, uh, both Klebanov and Ratchet are from, you know, uh, famous seminar uh, Soviet period, you know, uh, uh, headed by Zotarev. And uh, he has book, I'm not sure that it is translated in English, um, but uh, really interesting. I'm not sure that it works in your case, in your particular case with stable distribution, but you know, uh, the choice of matrix and distances uh, are very important to get, uh, you know, technical uh, uh, complexity of, uh, of the proofs and so on. Because um, in, in the case of Zoltarev, ideal matrix, uh, you can very simply get the right, uh, uh, <clears throat> the right uh, bound for, um, you know, rate of convergence. For example, if you have uh, um, identical distribution uh, and, and distributed random variables and uh, you have third moment you'll get the right uh, bound I mean the speed will be exactly uh, n uh, uh, minus uh, half yeah? so um, uh, I suppose that possibly uh, complexity of uh, you know, this bounds uh, depends essentially of uh, choice of your matrix. Possibly, I, I, I can suggest that there could be another uh, kind of matrix that are not based on a characteristic function. Right? Uh, yeah, that, that's my suggestion. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, certainly, um, uh, you know, th th there's different ways to, you know, different metrics that you could use and uh, I, I, yes, the Zolotaryk book, I think, uh, Modern Summation of Random Variables, it is translated to English and I have seen it, um, although I, I can't consider myself anywhere near an expert on that. Um, but th definitely you could, you know, one could consider different kinds of distances. I think the distance, the metric here, except for maybe the smoothing that we used, 
is a pretty natural one to think about. Um, now, in terms of why uh, we want to bound here with the characteristic functions, or use this d, d distance, which is not a metric, uh, based on characteristic functions, um, in, in a sense it's because uh, for stable distributions, uh, characteristic function is really what we have the most control over. Right, we, we, we know those really well, whereas talking about uh, their PDFs, right, there's no nice formula for them. So that's, uh, and, and of course for a lot of distributions that we're working with, uh, smoothly truncated Lebesgue flights and, and uh, uh, most, in fact, infinitely divisible distributions are really, we think of them in terms of their characteristic functions. So in, in that sense, that's uh, one of the advantages of looking at, uh, trying to bound things in terms of something related to characteristic functions. Uh, but I agree there might be uh, n uh, nice ways to do this in terms of other kinds of distances and metrics. Mm, there's no triangle on the quality what you mean. Uh, here there's there's no um, there's no triangle inequality and um, it, it doesn't I think it, it, it uh, I think it could be equal to no, uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's just no triangle. Uh, are there other questions? I understand now your remarks that if C tends to zero, then in your estimate we should be taken because we have some sort of explosion. Uh, exactly. Un again, unless um, unless x it belongs to the domain uh, to the so if y is strictly stable and x belongs to the domain of normal attraction, not just domain of attraction, but uh, the more restricted domain of normal attraction, then um, it, it will definitely blow up. So if it's, fi it's finite when we take c equal to zero, that's equivalent to it being in the domain of uh, the uh, normal do uh, domain of attraction of the uh, infinite variance stable. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe this is a good time for a break, yeah. and uh, so it's what about ten minutes, I think. Or... So uh, yeah, so I wanted now to discuss how we go about proving um, uh, that, that inequality. Um, so remember what we what we're trying to prove. We have this distance k h uh, between uh, our scaled partial sum s x n uh, and some strictly stable random. Uh, uh, vector y. Um, I'm actually, for, for simplicity, I'll just assume uh, that we're in a one dimension case uh, to make things a little bit easier. Uh, things don't really change very much in, uh, in general. And of course, this thing is the supremum over x, say in R, of the distance between f, um, fx star h, of, uh, not, not x, this is Sn, and f um, y, be consistent with how I write it, f y convoluted with h of x. Uh, this is already the soup norm, so I just need an uh, absolute value. So this is the thing that we're trying to get some bound on. And remember, what we want to get the bound in terms of is we want to get it uh, in terms of the characteristic functions. So in order to get to the characteristic functions, we'd like some way to go from, well, from a statement about this to a statement about the characteristic functions. Um, so before I really say exactly how we prove this, I want to just give uh, the idea of where the approach comes from. So, uh, we could, um, so there's a simple formula we can show that, um, of course, this is the L infinity norm. And in general, uh, for a function f, uh, the L infinity norm is less or equal to 1 over 2 pi of the L1 norm of the Fourier transform of f. Um, this is easy to show from the inversion formula. So this gives us a way to go from, right, because this is just, uh, I've written out all the details of the L infinity norm, uh, 
Uh, but this is just um, just the affinity norm. So we can try, and I won't uh, I won't get to the uh, this won't, this isn't really how the proof goes. But I just want to motivate the next steps of the proof because otherwise it will look very um, very complicated while I'm doing something. So we can then upper bound this by one over two pi. Um, integral over r uh, mu hat sn of uh, x minus mu hat y of x times uh, the Fourier transform of h uh, x uh, dx. I make a, I use slightly different notation uh, for these two Fourier transforms, uh, just to emphasize that this is a Fourier transform of a measure, right? So um, u y of x hat. This is um, integral over r e to the i x t uh, f. Uh, I'm sorry, d f sub y of uh, t, uh, whereas f uh, tilde of x is integral over r e to the i x t f of t dt. Um, so I just want to keep the, uh, of course, the, there's a lot of relationships between these two objects, but I just want to keep the notation um, set. So, so from um, so from that uh, formula that we wrote up here, uh, we can get this uh, bound, and of course we can divide this by uh, x to the gamma and multiply by x to the gamma, and now we're getting something that looks a lot like uh, like that distance that we have in our um, uh, in our inequality. Uh, I guess we, we could try and upper bound this by the supremum that this takes over the values of x. Uh, but there will basically be two problems with doing that. The first problem is that we know this thing basically blows up, right? If, if, we, right, if we just for, uh, leave this term here in terms of the uh, integral, and we just try and upper bound this over x, this thing blows up, right, as we discussed, unless there's a very strong relationship between uh, x1 and y. So we can't, we can't really do that directly. And moreover, even if we could, unless we had a strong condition about uh, the integrability of h tilde of x, even if we could get rid of this thing by upper bounding, uh, this, this term would basically make the integral, right, it wouldn't be, we're not guaranteed that the integral would converge either. So what we need is, in a sense, we want our uh, x's to be bounded away from zero, right, by, by that kind of c that we had, to make sure that this thing is okay. And at the same time, we want it bounded away from infinity to make sure that the resulting, the remaining integral is still uh, finite and still makes sense. So how can we do that? So, um, let me introduce a function um, i of x equals, I believe it's sine of x over, uh, over x, uh, and its Fourier transform is just uh, the indicator um, negative one, uh, I'm sorry, it's, uh, uh, no, I'm missing something, I need to think of delta here, uh, let me try and get the right, yep, uh, delta here, and do it, do it, do it. Uh, divide by delta, and now our Fourier transform uh, is going to be from minus delta to positive delta, um, and let me take V sub A of X uh, to be some kernel, um, uh, such that uh, v tilde a of x um, 
An absolute value is bounded by one, and uh, v tilde of a of zero equals one. And of course, most important, we wanted to also kind of serve as an indicator. So v tilde a of x equals zero if x is greater than uh, absolute value of x is greater than 2a. So this, uh, so in other words, our uh, Fourier transform v tilde essentially also kind of works as an indicator, but it's not actually the indicator because we want to guarantee that uh, v tilde a of 0 is going to be 1. So for that reason, we need something else. Um, so I, I do pick a particular form for v sub a, but maybe for now we just uh, consider it to be any kernel which satisfies the uh, given conditions. Okay, so now, maybe I can erase this, and I can say that this is um, going to be um, I don't want to keep re uh, keep writing the soup uh, everywhere. So maybe let me erase this. All right, we know that this is the object we're trying to bound. So let's consider f s n star h of x. And now we introduce this kernel v sub a. So f sub n uh, star h of x. Uh, star v a uh, till uh, I'm sorry no no x yet star v a of x. Now I also make a distinction between the two uh, convolutions because again I have a convolution that's in terms of a measure and one that will be based just on uh, functions. Um, so but but this is just uh, convolution. Okay, so I introduce, um, uh, so I add this, and now uh, I subtract this, so of course now I must um, add it, f uh, sub sn star h star v, sub v a of x minus um, f sn star h star uh, puts. So now I introduce also this um, i. i star v a of x. Plus f y star h star v a of x minus f s n star h star i star v a of x. So that's my second term. Uh, of course I need, um, so of course I need um, Probably you would F minus, but it doesn't matter because it's the quadrus anyway. So okay. uh, yes. Um, minus, minus. But it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's absolute value, but yes, uh, um, technically it's F, uh, F Y star H. Oh, uh, yes, you're right, probably I wrote it. And F uh, uh, Y star H star V A of X. And am I miss, I feel like I'm missing some terms here. Um, it looks like it's right. Just make sure that it's 
Sorry. Okay. Um, maybe maybe we'll uh, need to modify this, but ho hopefully this is. Uh, but what's the example of B of A? Oh um, yes. So, well, the example that we actually wind up using is um, the Jackson the the Poussin kernel, where um, W of X is. 12 sine to the power 4 of x over 2 divided by pi x um, to the fourth. And its Fourier transform is 1 minus 3x squared over 2 plus. What's A? Ah, uh, we define W A uh, of x to be. A times W of X over A. Yes. Uh, not what I'm not right. Times X. So it's this if X is less or equal to 1. 1 fourth times 2 minus A. Um, no, for W, but for, for W tilde, it turns out uh, A is going to be just W tilde of X over A. But for W A, it's uh, defined this way. And... Cube is out here. For 1 less or equal to X less or equal to 2. And, of course, 0 for X greater than or equal to 2. And, um, when we wind up dividing by A, we'll get exactly that's above um, uh, and, um, that X has to be greater than or equal to, uh, that whenever X is greater than or equal to 2A, it's zero. So it's exactly giving us uh, this condition. So that's the kernel that we actually use. Um, but um, again, let me uh, just write the uh, for simplicity. Okay, so uh, how can we how can we balance so evolution of four indicative functions, right? Which is a, which is a, a kind of elementary problem of probability. So this this is pro, morally this is a product of or four factors of this, or convolution of four indicator functions, which is some, some famous elementary problem. Uh, from elementary probability. Uh, uh, yeah, well, of course, uh, finding the convolution of uh, <laughs> uniform random variables yeah. is a standard problem. Uh, for us, of course, we're going to, uh, our whole, uh, so the actual things we're convoluting are not the indicator functions. We want the indicator, or, well, this is not, of course, a, really an indicator function, uh, but it is uh, zero for large x, and that, uh, and the reason we don't want the indicator there is because we want uh, this property, which uh, we, um, okay, so, um, Right, so we want to uh, bound this thing. So first, let's start with this uh, first part. Uh, what we can say is um, FSN, uh, let me just call this uh, T1. So T1 is, uh, you can write it as the integral over R, H of X minus T, uh, DF uh, 
Sn of t. Um, minus integral over r h of x minus t um, Now let, let me think of let me think of this as f s n plus z, where z is the, the a random variable independent of s n with distribution h. So we have this of x minus integral over r h of x minus t df y t and then of course this thing we can write uh, I'm sorry uh, uh, plus z and here is uh, v sub a right, so I'm combining these terms together and then I'm convoluting with this term okay and this first term I could also write as an integral integral over r uh, d f s n plus z of t now Uh, now, since we have this condition, that means that the integral of VA has to be 1. And so, um, um, oh, well, this integral is 1, so we could write a V of parts of the proof, um, but this will give us that this, uh, that the first part is bounded by um, integral over r, absolute value of t, uh, times absolute value of va of t, uh, dt. And, but to get this, we'll use, we need to use the Lipschitz condition, because we, we write this out with v, um, yeah, v of x uh, uh, but yeah so we need to write this in terms of v of x and then we can use um, Lipschitz condition on v uh, to get this uh, no I'm sorry that's not on oh I, I I'm sorry, I think well, it's not necessary to go into you will lie to the proof. Just say what, what you want. Step one, step two, and probably we can accept some steps. But go to the final step. Just stuff. to explain why each term of the sum is small. Okay. Um, well, th this, um, of course, it doesn't have to be small, right? It's only under uh, the right conditions. That we, and we have a lot of choice, right? We have choice over the parameters A and uh, delta. But uh, maybe let me talk about this central term, which is the one that, um, uh, that, that will give us the uh, distance that we want. Um, so that's um, all this term. Uh, T2, and so 
uh, C2 right, is going to be less than 1 over um, 2 pi, the L1 norm of the Fourier transform of uh, what's inside, which uh, we can write in a somewhat uh, simpler form as Um, maybe let me write it in terms of the integral. One minus I tilde of X times U hat SN of x minus mu hat y of x times um, h tilde of x times v a uh, tilde of x dx. Right, so that's from that inequality that we mentioned earlier and uh, basically the one minus because these terms, right, this doesn't have the i, and so we can just take one minus um, uh, that term. Right, so we have, um, sorry, just, should this be, uh, it probably needs to be a minus sign, and If you will get uh, estimate for T2, the formula you can uh, let that depends to zero and you will have the estimate for the first term. Right? Because uh, that's, uh, because, because in this case uh, E equals one identically and the Fourier transform also equals one and if the formula you have the same. If, uh, I don't want to say because you have V. Yeah, yes, and here there's no V. This, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure why I, I was having trouble thinking about the right way because it's actually, it's a, well, with the Lipschitz condition, it's very simple. I just, um, mm -hmm. but okay, uh, when we have this uh, here, now we can uh, do what we wanted. We can divide this by absolute value of x to the gamma and multiply by x to the gamma. And this thing, right, is just an indicator function. Now, this is an indicator function that we are uh, less than delta. So 1 minus that is the indicator that we are larger than delta. And V tilde, right, so that is um, uh, bounded by 1, and it's 0 outside of 2a. So this object is 1 over 2 pi integral over x between uh, delta and 2a. Uh, and that basically takes care of, uh, I'm sorry, upper bounded by. This, that gets rid of this term, which is what bounds us away from 0. And it gets rid of this term, We're bounding it up to 1, where it's not 0, and taking it to be 0, where it's 0. So we get uh, this term uh, times x to the gamma. And here now we can upper bound this as we are only looking at x's that are uh, bigger than delta. This we can upper bound by, well, let me write uh, the rest of it, dx. And this we can upper bound as sup over x greater than uh, delta mu hat Sn of x minus mu hat y. Uh, maybe I should use, call, uh, let me call this um, C. But it seems that you, you can get even constants because you, you have written C before. Um, yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, you have. Uh, Concrete constants. Oh, uh, yes, we have concrete. Uh, oh, you mean how to choose delta and a? No, no. 
You have written in your formulation a C capital. Oh, yeah. Um, like an unknown constant, but, but here you mean. Oh, uh, it, it, that was just in the upper bound to focus on the examples. In the general case, I give the actual constants. So, okay, so we can upper bound this way, right? Um, bring, of course, the absolute value uh, inside. Right, so we bring the absolute value inside, and we upper bound this as this distance. Um, and here we have this term. H is uh, just a characteristic function of some distribution because we assume that H uh, was um, right, some probability, uh, probability density. So this is just a characteristic function. It has to be bounded by 1. So we can upper bound this by 1 over 2 pi. Um, integral from minus 2a to 2a, x to the gamma uh, dx. And here we have basically d sub delta comma gamma of Sn comma y. Uh, this term, of course, we can integrate. That's not a problem. But what can we do with this term here? So let me write out this term. So d sub uh, delta gamma of Sn comma y is uh, sup over z greater than delta um, mu hat of z Sn minus mu hat of uh, z y over z to the gamma and absolute value. But now, what, can we, what do we know about the distribution of Sn? Sn is equal to um, x1 plus x2 plus up to uh, xn over n to the 1 over alpha. So in other words, um, we can write mu hat of Sn of x as mu hat of x1 of x um, over root n, uh, not root n, over n to the 1 over n. And similarly, Uh, similarly, we know that y, y is strictly stable. And since it's strictly stable, by definition, if uh, y1, y2, up to yn are iid copies of y, uh, then y is equal in distribution to y1 plus y2 plus up to yn over n to the 1 over n. And so that means that this, oh, I'm sorry, this is, of course, raised to the power n. And mu hat y of x is then mu hat uh, raised to the power n of, well, still y, of x over n to the 1 over alpha. So, for, for the first part, it comes because we have a sum that's properly scaled, and for the second part, it comes from the strict stability of y. So, we can represent uh, the characteristic functions in this way. And then, what we're really interested in is this uh, difference so mu hat Sn of x minus mu hat y of z over z to the gamma we can write as mu hat 
x1 of z over root n minus mu hat y of z to the n over, sorry, not root n, n to the 1 over alpha, n to the 1 over alpha over z to the gamma. And then, by properties of differences of powers, we can upper bound this by n times mu hat x1 of z over n to the 1 over alpha minus mu hat of z over uh, y of z over n to the 1 over alpha divided by z to the gamma. And I haven't been writing this, but of course everywhere here we have this soup, z greater than delta, soup. And here we have soup, z greater than delta of this term. So if we now do a change of variables, right? Take, say, y equals z over n to the 1 over alpha. Um, we wind up with uh, soup over, so we had uh, z here, so we have now, y uh, greater than delta n to the minus 1 over alpha, mu hat x1 above y minus mu hat y of y divided by norm of y times n to the gamma over alpha. I'm sorry? Um, oh, y to the power of gamma. Thank you very much. <coughs> so we have this uh, inequality, and oh, and I forgot, of course, we have an n out here. So now we can write this as soup, or well, actually, we can now use or write this in terms of our d distance. Uh, delta times n to the minus 1 over alpha time of uh, x1 comma y divided by n to the gamma over alpha minus 1. Of course, minus 1 comes with this n out here. So this is the main, uh, I think, step of the proof where we basically show where this distance comes from. And um, uh, well, of course, we have to multiply by this term here, so that gives us some additional constants that multiply this. Um, okay, so does this part make sense? Okay, um, so there's a, we can use various approaches to bound the other parts. This is probably the most important part to show how to bound because it's in terms of uh, this distance um, uh, d that shows us how we get this uh, to come into play. But if you use uh, h t the by 1, you can lose uh, quite essential. I'm sorry? If you you can lose uh, quite essential. When you replace your... Uh, uh, sure. Uh, <coughs> later. Um, sure, uh, we definitely could get things more direct if we wanted to just fix a particular h, say as a particular normal distribution, then definitely we could get more structure in, in this and, uh, and get a tighter bound. Um, I guess we wanted to let h be more general so that you could choose which one you like, but, uh, but certainly if you are happy using the normal distribution, then 
Um, if you could plug in the, uh, the characteristic function here, and uh, you, you would get a definitely better bandwidth for that situation. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so, so maybe the, uh, for the proof of the theorem, uh, this is uh, said the main part. Um, I think we still have time, so I can talk a little bit about how we got the bound in one of the special cases. Um, so for that, I have some slides, but maybe it's better to... Uh, okay, so, um, so, from the, uh, so from the preliminary theorem that we had, we saw that in the case of the truncated symmetric Pareto, uh, we can get uh, this upper bound. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, where this upper bound comes from. And, um, and I think in some ways maybe this is more, about how, uh, more useful because it talks about how we can actually use the theorem to derive some results about particular situations. And in particular, remember I introduced this um, uh, natural scale. So this is a way of talking about how we can get such a natural scale. For this distribution. So, uh, of course, in one dimension, this is what the uh, theorem tells us. Now, how do we get those bounds specifically for the symmetric Pareto distribution? So, remember, the symmetric Pareto distribution has uh, this density given here. Um, now, I'm writing the normalizing constant explicitly. I think before I just left it as uh, some general constant. And, of course, its characteristic function is given, uh, given this way. Now, if we didn't do the truncation, it would, uh, the, par the partial sum under this normalization would, as n goes to infinity, approach uh, a stable distribution uh, y, which has a characteristic function of this form with, um, with this constant c alpha. So this we can get from just basic um, central limit theorem results. But now, um, what happens when we have the truncation? Right? So we know uh, that we can take our, uh, our inequality from the theorem, and, well, let's not worry too much about the constant, so we can upper bound it by some constant times, uh, times this term here. So again, now we have just... Um, 1 over a, which you'd want to choose something large for a to make small, so small, choose some small delta to make this part small. But what can we do with this term here? We need to say something about this distance d. So, of course, the distance d is just the difference between the characteristic function of the truncated um, symmetric Pareto and the limiting stable distribution uh, divided by z to the gamma, and of course, taking the supremum when, X, when z is larger than some, uh, some constant c. So what we can do is, right, we want to uh, start by bounding the, this, uh, the difference in the numerator, and we can uh, just add and subtract uh, this term here, which is um, uh, basically our c, um, c alpha. Uh, I'm sorry, which is basically our characteristic function, um, but if we hadn't done the truncation. So we're basically we're saying, well, we know that the characteristic function, if we hadn't done the truncation, should be close to the uh, characteristic function of the limiting stable in some ways. And on the other hand, it should also be close to the characteristic function of the truncated symmetric parameter. And so we have these two parts, R1 and R2. Now, one thing we could notice about R2, it's, uh, it's easy to see, this is a characteristic function here, so it has to be bounded by 1. Um, and this term here, uh, we can kind of upper bound it, get rid of the cosine, and, it, and without the cosine, it integrates to 1. So clearly, R2 has to be bounded by 2. Uh, moreover, if uh, lambda is between 0 and 1, then um, if, the, if we look at R2, if we add and subtract um, C alpha lambda alpha, 
this term here and here. Um, then we have two parts, right, and that we can say something about. Now, the first part is uh, pretty simple because basically this is just the first two parts in the Taylor expansion of e to the minus c alpha lambda to the power alpha. So since lambda, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so and, and c alpha is small uh, between zero and one, so uh, yeah, so by the Taylor expansion of, of this thing, by the, or the Taylor expansion is going to be an alternating series, so by the remainder theorem, we can upper bound this difference here by the next term in the Taylor expansion. And uh, here we can uh, go back to the definition of C alpha, which is, um, which is basically the integral from zero to infinity. Um, of uh, um, sorry. of this term, and we can get a uh, bound very simply of this form. And so, um, taking into account what we said that R two when lambda is bigger, well, it's always bounded by two, and certainly when lambda is bigger than one, it's bounded by two. We can basically. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to talk about R1. So, um, let me see. So, R1 uh, given here, well, basically, um, aside for the, the, the denominator here, this is almost very similar terms, except this goes from 1 to infinity, and the first term goes from 1 to t. So, um, if we just separate uh, here, this going from 1 to t, and separately look at from t to infinity, we basically wind up with um, the first part here, which we can, if we uh, upper bound, bring the absolute values inside the integrals, bound away the cosines by 1, and evaluate the integral, we'll see that it's bounded by 2 to the t to the minus, uh, 2 times t to the minus alpha. Uh, okay, and so combining those parts together, we can see that the, this difference between the characteristic function of the truncated symmetric Pareto and the um, uh, stable distribution is uh, bounded in this way, where B alpha is uh, this constant. So now for uh, gamma uh, between alpha and the minimum of 2 and 2 alpha, Right. And that, uh, that comes from the fact that we, here we have 2 and 2 alpha. So when we divide by lambda to the power gamma, uh, on this part here, we would want, um, right, we want something that lambda, since it's less than 1, we want it to get raised to a positive power. So we want, so when we divide by lambda to the power gamma, we want um, right, lambda to the 2 minus gamma and lambda to the 2 uh, times alpha minus gamma to both be positive, that way we'll be able to bound this maximum divided by lambda to the gamma by one. And so, uh, in that case, we'll just be left with the maximum of two and uh, b sub alpha. And of course, when we take two uh, times t to the minus alpha divided by z to the gamma, uh, when, since we're we only care about it when z is bigger than uh, we're able to see, we can upper bound by c to the minus gamma. And then, again, we want to select a uh, so that it's fairly large, and delta so it's fairly small. And we can make these choices um, here, and if we think about it, right, what we want is for n small relative to t, because that's going to be the only case we can get something small. When n is uh, large relative to t, then of course we know it's not going to be close to stable. So for that reason, um, right, we, we think of n times t to the minus alpha as being uh, small because we're specifically focusing on the case when it's close to the stable and so 
n is uh, n times t to the minus alpha is in that case going to be small. So if we make this choice of delta and a and plug it into what we the upper bound we had before, we wind up exactly with the formula uh, that we had um, discussed. Okay. Um, so I think that's uh, what I wanted to say here. Um, are there any questions? Um, 
which will still look somewhat like a stable, but now not necessarily just a rice skewed stable, but basically any kind of stable in the center, but it will have, nevertheless, have tails that decay exponentially fast. And in fact, the, the smoothly truncated would be flights that we discussed today, um, that's actually this distribution. Now today we only focus on the symmetric case, but in general, we can have um, other such distributions. So this is a uh, smoothly truncated Levy flight distribution. And then if we can consider, okay, well this is maybe a, a nice distribution with these properties, but it's, um, it's not closed under aggregation, right? If we add uh, INZ random variables of this type, they're not going to still be smoothly truncated with flights. So that suggests that, especially for modeling returns where we really care about adding random variables, it suggests that this is uh, maybe not quite capturing everything we want. So if we consider the class of models that, um, uh, that is this, but uh, that, that starts with this class of distributions, closes its undertaking uh, add addition of these random variables, and also close it, closes it undertaking weak limits, uh, then that's a pretty large class of models, which at least under a particular choice of the parameters will have this property of, um, of being kind of like a stable in some central region, but with lighter tails. So this more general class of models is called the class of a tempered stable distributions. So in, uh, in the second lecture, I want to talk about this class of models, uh, discuss various properties that they have, um, talk about their associated living processes and uh, how they behave, and um, talk a little bit about how those processes can be uh, in some sense close to stable at small times, but, in, but close to a normal at large times, exactly the kind of behavior we discussed today, but um, at the level of processes and not just kind of uh, independent random variables. So that's what I want to talk about in the next lecture. In lecture three, I want to give some uh, applications of these uh, distributions and talk about how they, at least certain distributions of this type, how they can come up in uh, applications in particular to trying to model mobility of, say, how humans walk um, uh, in, in an area. And that, that comes up in uh, computer science, for instance, because in computer science, we need to be able to model how humans walk, because if you want to figure out how some, um, uh, some protocol works, which if this protocol involves people with cell phones, in order to capture whether, in order to do simulations of people with, moving with cell phones, we need to have some idea of how these people uh, behave when they're moving. And it seems that tempered stable distributions can be used quite nicely to model in these situations. And um, so I want to talk about that and talk a little bit about um, risk estimation with tempered stable distributions. And in particular, talk about value at risk, which um, is one of the most commonly used measures of risk. But it does not encourage diversification in general. So I'll talk a bit about when it does encourage diversification. <coughs> Uh, for tempered stable as well as slightly more uh, general classes of models. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And, uh...